you know, the, the hallmark of a great CISO is the ability to, to master relationship management. So wherever you report, if you're not meeting regularly with people outside of security, um, if you're not giving them updates on the status of, of the risk of the organization, um, if you're not just cultivating you know, good friendships, whether personal friendships or professional friendships, you're not going to get far. This is a Security Weekly production. Security Weekly is a resource of Cyber Risk Alliance. The Cybersecurity Collaborative is proud to present CISO Stories. Each week, CISO Stories takes a deep dive on security leadership with one of the contributors to my latest book, the best-selling CISO Compass Navigating Cybersecurity Leadership Challenges with Insights from Pioneers, as well as other top CISOs and industry security leaders. The Cybersecurity Collaborative is a unique membership community enabling cybersecurity leaders to work together in a trusted environment. To learn more, visit securityweekly.com slash CSC or visit cyberleadersunite.com. I am your host, Todd Fitzgerald, and this week we welcome Stephen Freed, Digital Risk Principal at American Family Insurance. I got back in the, in the field back when it was barely a field, and I had uh, was working for AT&T at the time and running a software development group, and one of the things we had developed was what we now know as single sign-on, but at the time was just a thing you logged into that logged you into all your other applications. So the inevitable reorganization came up and they tried to figure out what to do with my team. And they said, well, they made that security thing. Why don't we put them over with the security group? So I went over and and never left. Uh, So uh, what's attracted me to stay uh, over the long haul is just the, the idea that it's always changing. You're always learning something new. You're always doing something different. I come in every morning and have no idea how that day is gonna go. I have a plan as most of us have a plan. Uh, and that plan could be perfect. I could have all of my meetings or something could happen at 7.45, which throws the whole day into a tizzy, which can get a little hairy, but that, that's what attracts me and that's what keeps me here. Just It's constantly changing and it's always new. That's nice. I, I know the, the constant change would probably scare some people uh, away from the field. Yeah, some people are like that. Some people like to know they're going to come in and they know exactly what they're going to do and they do it and they go home, uh, which is great. And, and you know, I'll admit, even I like that every now and then, uh, but I, I probably wouldn't last in that kind of a role very long. I, I do like the fact that it's, it's a bit unpredictable. Well, and you can also learn a lot more things when you're exposed to a lot more things as well. You learn a lot. You learn how to think on your feet. You learn how to make decisions in the absence of complete information. You learn a lot about people. So, so we did a, a CISO Stories podcast not long ago with uh, Ed Amoroso uh, at AT and T. Was he was he there at the same time you were there? Uh, he was. We overlapped a little bit. I, I didn't know Ed at the time, uh, but he was there for a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, it, you wrote a great piece for the CISO Compass book, navigating cybersecurity leadership challenges with insights from pioneers, which you clearly were working uh, on these issues way back when. I remember uh, a couple decades ago, when when we were on some panels together for some CISO uh, leadership uh, conferences, uh, which uh, you know it, t- it takes us back a ways. Yeah, it does. Uh, yeah, organizational placement is something that has fascinated me for a long time uh, for a number of reasons. First, I've reported pretty much everywhere you could report um, as a security pro, um, both as a you know a CISO and a manager and, and now as an internal consultant. I've reported mostly to, to IT, which is you know, will probably be the bulk of our discussion, but I've reported into risk. I've reported to legal. I've reported to facilities. Um, it's usually houses the physical security team. Um, so this idea that I always hear of, you know, where should the CISO report has always been kind of interesting. It's one of the, the, the great party games of the security profession. Usually at the end of the day at a big security conference, when you all gathered around the bar um, and somebody raises the question, where should the CISO report or makes a bold statement like CISO should never report to IT. That's when the party gets started. And that's, that's when the conversation gets interesting. So, so you did write in, in your piece, the best reporting relationship for a CISO may not be what you think. Um, so, so what's your view on that uh, you see, uh, about not reporting uh, to the CISO or should you be reporting to the CISO? 
Um, well, the the whole gist of the article, and, and I, I went back and reread it because it's been, it's been a couple of years since I wrote it and certainly have read it again. And, and my opinion hasn't changed. The best place for the CISO to report is wherever the organization needs that that person in that function to report. It may be IT, it may be risk, you know, some of the areas I mentioned before. And the question to ask is really, why should or shouldn't it be part of IT? It's where's the organization that's gonna give me the resources, the support, the visibility to do what I need to do to protect the organization and its customers. So just starting the conversation by saying, should we report to IT or not, is really starting at the wrong end of the conversation. You know, what, one of the things we like to say around here, and I wish I'd coined this phrase, but one of my colleagues did, you know, what, what's the problem we're trying to solve? And the problem we're trying to solve is not where do we place it in the organization, is how do we have the most impact on the company and, and its customers? So what are some of those advantages that you see in reporting to the CIO? I think the biggest advantage, at least for most organizations, and, and of course, every organization is different, but generally, there, there's quite frankly more money in IT. Um, it's the organization that buys the big expensive technology that has the big expensive experts, and, and not the money is not spent in other areas, because of course it is, but they're generally used to having these larger technical expenses, and by and large, for better or worse, I think worse, IT is still largely, see, or I'm sorry, um, Info security is still largely seen as a technical discipline. In the organizations that are more mature that see it as a risk discipline, then you start to see it pulled out of IT and move perhaps into other areas of the business or kept within IT, but the recognition is there that they're not there just to manage firewalls and switches and any, and any malware. They're there to manage the digital risk environment. Other organizations may handle business risk or physical risk. Um, the, the CISO organization is there to handle the digital risk aspect of it from within or, or without. But that, that's generally why it's in IT. They have more money, quite frankly. And, and I think it's interesting, just kind of the whole nomenclature where the National Association of Corporate Directors came out with the, the five principles, not and I think it was right after the target breach that, that those came out. And the first principle in there is that uh, cybersecurity needs to be looked at as an enterprise-wide risk management issue and not just an IT issue. And it's and, and I think we, we've almost confused some of the nomenclature because this is what boards are reading and they read the word cybersecurity. Uh, and then at the same time, we're saying this is this is not a an IT issue, it's a risk management issue. Um, but so, so you know, it's, it's not surprising, I guess, that, that, you know, we tend to look at this as an, as an IT issue. Well, it's just, just the name cybersecurity, um, which always brings up, you know, connotations of, of technology, of robotics, of automation, of, you know, all the, the matrix vision of the ones and zeros scrolling across the screen. That's just, kind of the environment that the word uh, denotes. And it does have a lot of aspects of that, but um, as, as you just pointed out, you know, there's a lot of general risk management discipline that's part of cybersecurity and has been for a while. It's only until relatively recently it, start to be, it started to be more widely understood and, and more widely adhered to. So, so what are some of those downsides of, of reporting into IT? that people should be aware of? Uh, there, are, there are a couple downsides, some of them real, some of them theoretical. I'll start with the real ones. You know, the downside is you, you do get pigeonholed as, as, a, as a technical organization. And so you may or may not be asked to, uh, to support or opine on some of the more generic risk management aspects of the position. And, and certainly there's a lot of you know, technical disciplines within cybersecurity. There's a lot of general risk management, you know, assessment and, and controls and such. So being within IT, uh, you have a potential to lose that. Uh, that's, you know, one of the real aspects, one of the theoreticals. And this is what you always hear as part of these, you know, after conference, you know, bar conversations is, well, there's a conflict of interest that, you know, security shouldn't report to IT because uh, the CISO may report on vulnerabilities and the CIO can ignore them. Which, yeah, I suppose is true. Absolutely. Uh, I have a hard time believing that's as widespread in 2022, especially given the public nature of a lot of the breaches, the, the, the activism that a lot of states have under, undertaken, 
to hold companies accountable for their cybersecurity uh, and just the overall growth and, and visibility of the industry. Um, I just don't think that's as real a problem as it may have been in the past. Um, any CISO worth their salt, uh, if they feel resistance from any part of their management chain, um, is going to, to work to get that understood, whether you report into the CIO or you report into legal or you report into the chief risk officer. So I think that the downside are, are just, it forces the CISO to be much more outgoing and, and much more, I'll use the word forceful, but in, in a good professional way um, of making sure that the, the digital risk and, and the technology risk that they're dealing with is well understood by the leadership of the organization. Um, certainly to have a good relationship with, with your, your higher ups, your CIO and such, um, but to also cultivate those relationships with other parts of the business, um, the so-called dotted line relationships. And a good CISO and, and certainly a good CIO will understand those dotted lines have to exist and, and support them. What, what can a, a CISO do to, to make sure that if they are within the CIO's organization, that they're getting enough attention for security and that they're getting the right uh, amount of budget and priority uh, for the mission the, that security is trying to protect the information assets? It really comes down to just really good relationship management. And, and as you start to look at, you know, that the, the question of, you know, where should the CISO report? There are really three overall aspects to, to making that determination. One is the, the maturity of the organization, Two is the culture of the organization, and three is the relationship management that the CISO is able to bring to that organization and to that function. So, you know, does the CISO, you know, cultivate really good cooperative and, and supportive relationships with all levels of the organization, both up and down? Um, can they directly engage leadership when they need to? Um, do they know when to go through channels and when necessarily not to go through channels? Um, are they good at giving and earning respect? within the organization, because that's absolutely critical to the CISO role is, is gaining that respect, uh, not just of your immediate reports, um, but of your leadership of the board of directors of the people you need to convince that they need to act on whatever the risk situation happens to be and provide you know, moral support, money, people, whatever it happens to be. Um, are they accountable for, the, for their actions and for the actions of their team? Um, that goes towards sort of earning that respect. Um, do they internalize and then do they advance company-wide goals and company-wide uh, objectives over their own personal objectives? Now, you know, I'm not naive. Everybody in, in industry and everybody in any industry has personal objectives and personal career objectives. But part of being the effective CISO is to be able to balance that and understand that your first mission is toward the organization and their objectives. And do you emulate that? And do you exemplify that in the work that you do? Uh, and then I think finally the last thing is, can you communicate to both technical and non-technical audiences the same information and have them both um, you know, understood and, and knowledgeable about what you're trying to tell them and the action you're trying to get them to produce? So, I mean, that, that's a lot to kind of take in, but the good CISOs can do the majority of that and learn to do the things that they're not natively good at. The article this podcast is based upon can be viewed in the best-selling cybersecurity leadership book, CISO Compass, Navigating Cybersecurity Leadership Challenges with Insights from Pioneers. And, and you, you talked in your piece about balancing risk uh, and, and operational management. Uh, how, does, how does a CISO do that effectively? It's hard. Uh, you know, it's very hard. And I, and I know this. I was, I was looking for that easy answer. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> if I had the easy answer, Todd, I would have written the book. <laughs> um, but you did. And you did an excellent job of it. Um, it's, it's, it's just, it's really hard. It's a function of all the things I talked about. It's, it's knowing the industry, certainly having, you know, a good knowledge and good experience of just the environment you're in and the environment around exter internal and external. It's being able to have good trusted advisors who can counsel you on areas where you may be weak in. Uh, you, be, you may be great at organizational management and communication. You may not know how the internals of your Cisco firewall are working. That's okay. As long as you have people who you trust that can guide you to that. You know, what are the good capabilities of, of your DLP system? Um, you know, how does whitelisting and blacklisting? I mean, there, there's a bunch of different disciplines that, uh, 
having those people that you can go to and trust and, and using that as a team to help make decisions. I mean, as, as the CISO, as the leader, you're ultimately responsible for the decisions that you make and the consequences, good and bad. Um, but I don't know any good CISO that doesn't rely on those trusted advisors to help make those decisions. Absolutely. So you, you, you said that you reported before to legal risk uh, facilities. Uh, what, what about those areas for reporting relationships? Um, how, how do they help the, the security program? Uh, well, you know, again, it all was a function of, you know, the maturity and the culture of the organization at the time. Um, so reporting to risk management or whatever you call it in your organization um, is helpful because they just fundamentally understand risk and risk assessment um, and risk categorization and, and all those kind of administrative and analytical pieces uh, where I think a lot of folks in the technical cybersecurity end um, focus on those areas and not necessarily general risk. So it's great from a standpoint of, you know, being in a good risk management foundation. Uh, the downside of that, of course, is cybersecurity can get very technical. And I think many in the risk management area get lost in that technology and then tend to kind of fog over when it gets discussed. So you got to work extra hard to, to help them understand what it means from a risk perspective. Uh, facilities have reported there. Um, and I use facilities as kind of a stand in for whoever manages the building and real estate, because that's typically where your physical security organizations are. And so, you know, there's an advantage there because all of the security disciplines and all the you know, processes around you know, incident response and identifying intrusion and reacting and, and recovery, um, they understand all those areas very well because that's what they do on a physical level. We do it on, on sort of a logical level. So that works out well. Uh, the, the downside again is, is kind of the, the more technical and esoteric areas of cyber risk, um, trying, to, trying to get a, a hardcore physical security person to understand that you know someone can be sitting halfway around the world and be manipulating you know information in your database and look as if they're coming from Cleveland, uh, you know it's 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 a little more difficult. Um, again, over the last few years, everyone's gotten a lot more knowledgeable about how this works, and it's not such a surprise or a hard sell anymore. Um, but it's a, it's a different kind of approach. So uh, again, it gets back to where does the organization need you to be. And, and from a purely selfish standpoint from the cybersecurity side, you know, where can, can our program go to get the support and the funding and the resources and the visibility that it needs? And if that's in IT, then that's where we should be. If that's in risk, then that's where we need to be. If it's in you know, facilities or physical security, that's where we need to be. I think I wrote in the uh, CISO Compass book that there's a, you know, one place that, that I, I think it, it actually makes a lot of sense uh, to report to the CIO. And that's when somebody's starting out in their program. Uh, and because a lot of the issues that you're, that you're dealing with are those things around vulnerabilities not being fixed, uh, patch management not being there. Uh, improvements needed in the identity and access management uh, program, understanding where all your assets are, those different things tend to lead to a very IT focused uh, approach. And, and you're not quite at that level yet where you're having these strategic conversations uh, around risk uh, with an organization. And so it hasn't evolved to that. Have, have you seen that sort of dynamic? Um, I haven't personally, um, although so I'm trying to think back on my career. I've, I've been fortunate enough to be able to start up a number of security programs for fairly large organizations. And then kind of looking back as you, as you say that, uh, yeah, you're right. You do tend to, tend to start in the technical areas. Um, if for no other reason than they're the most visible, uh, you can see them and you can't touch them, but you can explain them. You can demonstrate their effect and their impact on the infrastructure. You can point to a report and say, look, that's the vulnerability I'm talking about and here's the effect it has and extrapolate. Um, so yeah, that, that would be uh, the, a great place to start. And the, and the remediation for those, maybe not necessarily the origin, but the remediation is generally in the IT organization. You're patching systems, you're patching applications, um, you're putting you know, rules together, whether the firewall rules or IDS or IPS rules. Um, and that's all concentrated within IT. So it's a great learning ground as long as you can 
hopefully soon, uh, reach out to understand if there's a bigger risk impact to what's going on here. Yes, we'll, we'll, you inherently understand if I reduce my vulnerabilities from half a million down to 100,000, I'm going to have less risk. But once you start to understand the risk discipline around that, you can demonstrate that to others. You can explain how that affects the organization. You can ex explain how that affects your customers. And that's when you start maturing both your own personal knowledge as, as a CISO and maturing the, the program itself to the point where you can start to elevate the conversation around the organization. Mm -hmm. What, what sort of things with, with legal, you mentioned you reported to the legal department before, <clears throat> What's, what sort of advantages, disadvantages did, did you experience in that reporting relationship? The advantage of, of reporting to legal, especially if you're in a very regulatory heavy environment or a very compliance heavy environment, they're in a very good position to tell you what will or what may or may not get the company in trouble. I mean, it, it, in plain language. And so they're very good at identifying, you know, what is and isn't against the law and certainly have to avoid everything that's flat out against. When there are things, and, and, and you know this, Todd, and, and I've experienced this, a lot of laws are kind of vague. And a lot of the, the statutes that we have are kind of vague where they say, you know, you must do this thing, but the thing is very generic. You know, you must have secure communications with your vendors. Okay, can you tell me what secure communications means? Um, you must protect personally identifiable information. Okay, there's you know a number of ways to do that. Being part of the legal team can help you interpret the legislative legalese into an actionable plan for the organization. They'll certainly have a lot more knowledge about you know what precedents have been set and what court cases have come up and who's gotten sued for what and how to stay clear of that. So it can be very advantageous from that particular standpoint. Uh, the downside is, is similar to other non-technical disciplines is, um, you know, the le uh, legal teams and all the legal teams I've, I've been, have ever worked with have been really smart and sharp, but they're not technicians. They don't do cybersecurity all day, every day. And so may not have a good appreciation or understanding for the broader category of risks beyond just the you know, immediate statute or legislation that you're trying to comply with. So there's an education process. There. So, so you've covered a lot of different <clears throat> reporting relationships today. And if you're a CISO that's applying for a job somewhere and, uh, you know, the job opening is for somebody who's reporting to the CIO, should they run away or stay? No, I, I wouldn't run away um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, you know, it's <laughs> who you report to certainly has a large impact on your enjoyment of the position, um, but you, you, you shouldn't run away just because it's a particular position. Um, you should run away if the job sounds dull or the, C, the CIO who you inter with, interview with has no interest in understanding risk, just wants to get all the vulnerabilities patched. You know, there, there are real job related reasons to run away. I absolutely would not run away just because it reported to a CIO or a risk management or legal. Um, certainly I would, under, I would try to understand during the interview process, why is it there? Um, you know, why did the organization feel it was best to be with an IT or legal or risk or wherever? And then use that interview process to understand whether or not you agree with its placement. If you do, or if you're okay with it and it doesn't bother you, then by all means, apply for the job if it sounds interesting and it pays well. Um, if it doesn't sound good, you know, that's something you're going to be bumping your head again, head up against from day one. So take that into account before you sign on the, on the line. That's great advice, Steve. It's been a pleasure talking with you today and, and as people are trying to navigate this. Uh, what sort of advice would you give to current emerging uh, experienced CISOs as they're trying to navigate their reporting relationships? I think the best advice would be just be open to not just where you report, but who else influences the program and can influence the program. Because as I mentioned, you know, the, the hallmark of a great CISO is the ability to, to master relationship management. So wherever you report, if you're not meeting regularly with people outside of security, um, if you're not giving them updates on the status of, of the risk of the organization, um, if you're not just cultivating 
you know, good friendships, whether personal friendships or professional friendships, you're not going to get far. So wherever you report, make every effort to get outside that organization and meet people around the company, learn how the business works, learn how it functions, learn, learn what its concerns are. And then you can bring that back within the security organization and make it responsive to the needs of the business. Well, it's been a pleasure talking with you today, Steve. That's great advice. I think that's a good place to leave it. Um, thanks for the contributions to the CISO Compass book and for the work you've done in sharing your information in the industry. Well, thank you very much, Todd. It's been great catching up with you. Thank you. Visit more CISO Stories podcasts on securityweekly.com, where you will find an index of prior episodes. The Cybersecurity Collaborative is a unique membership community enabling cybersecurity leaders to work together in a trusted environment. To learn more, visit securityweekly.com slash CSC or visit cyberleadersunite.com.